All right, so in this video, it's going to be pretty much a quick, uh, it might not be quick, try to make it as quick as possible, pretty much down and dirty on fuel injectors. So I'll go over some common terms as far as body style, um, sizing, a little bit about how injectors work, um, some terms like flow matching, offsets, you know, uh, flow rates, that kind of stuff. So without further ado, let me jump into it. So. I have some injectors here. Uh, I guess the first thing I'll talk about is um, how the injector works. It's a pretty simple device. So fuel fuel comes in. Uh, there's a solenoid coil. It gets uh, a signal to open and energizes from the PCM. And it has a, a plunger and a spring-loaded valve, pintle valve. So essentially the, coil the solenoid coil energizes it pulls the plunger, you know, creates a magnetic field, pulls the plunger up, opens the pintle valve, and then pulses fuel out the bottom. And when we <coughs> run injectors, we talk about pulse width and duty cycle um, because there's two basic things that determine what, how much fuel an injector will deliver. One is the actual pintle cap or metering plate on the bottom, and then how long the injector pulses for. So right, so at high RPM, higher pulse width, the uh, uh, pulse width is longer, wider. You know, the injectors open longer. So if we were to look at injectors opening as like a, a um, on a graph, right, that would be like a, a pulse width, and then at a higher RPM, the injectors pulse open longer. If that makes sense. So since I talked about caps, here are some common ones. So when I mean the tip. Um, can determine the flow rate so most injectors have some kind of metering plate so this happens to be I believe uh, a coyote injector I think it's a newer one so you can see it has a little braised down plate that has four small pinholes right and I think this is like a 28 pound injector pounds per hour we'll get into all that in a minute um, the Siemens DECA 80 here it has one large center pinhole right and also your metering plate can affect your spray pattern too. And then this two, Bosch 210 has four huge slots in the metering cap, right? Here's like a GM Delphi truck injector. It has two small pinholes in the center, right? So the metering cap and how long it pulses for determines the flow, right? So this injector... Right, and also the, like the strength of the coil and the, the flow geometry has some to do with it, right? Um, but usually most modern injectors or Bosch injectors have the same body style, and then they slight variances in geometry and the, and, the, and the cap to deliver, you know, have a higher flow rate than another injector. That's why you might get two Bosch injectors that the bodies physically look the same. This is a 1,000 cc and this is, you know, 400 cc, right? Because this, this one doesn't have a metering plate. It just has a single orifice. You can see the bottom of the pintle valve right there. So that's that's the basics of flow. Um, I'll get into some terms now. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with some easy formulas. I like rules of thumbs and formulas for calculating, you know, what size injector do I need for my setup and my fuel type and my boost level? So I'll go over that at the end too. Um, so you'll hear different things. Um, uh, plug connectors. That's a big one. Guys get confused about. Uh, this is like a Delphi plug connector. This is like an old truck, GM truck injector. It's like a Delphi style connector right there. Not commonly seen on Ford applications, right? This is a Denso or Semitomo connector on this 210. So you would need some kind of plug adapter to run it on a, a car that's, you know, Jetronic or US car, which is the most common found on Fords and modern domestic vehicles. Um, this is a, called a Jetronic plug. It's more squared off. It's got these little tabs on the side. So that's a Jetronic mini timer plug. And then the most common new injectors are US car or used car, however you want to say it. It's more rounded, has the only the tabs on the side. So that's an S car. Uh, people often confuse 
um, Bosch body style with the plug. <laughs> there is usually some correlation, but not always. So you have to be careful. Um, like EV. So like an EV1, most EV1s had a jet Jetronic plug. But towards the end of the cycle, you can find EV1s that had SCAR and Jetronic plugs. So the plug doesn't always mean the body style, right? That's what I'm trying to get at. It's often used in, you know, used that way, but just know there are some variances. And then the next generation was EV6. Most EV6 injectors had an SCAR plug, but early on, some EV6 body styles still had Jetronic. I think the most common thing you see that in is like the... Um, Cobra Ford 39 pound injectors, the blue body, blue giants, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, they were on the Cobras and then, the, you know, early to mid, late 2000s, you could get them with an, they were, they were all EV1 body style, but you could get them with a Jetronic or an Ascar plug. So just be aware of that. Um, and like I said, if you, if your car has a certain kind of plug, they make either splice in or plug and play adapters to run any kind of injector plug style on your car's harness. So that's really not a big deal. So there's a little bit about injector works, body style, plugs. Now I'll get into some of the terms. Uh, the first one is impedance or Z, low Z, high Z. Z is just the electrical symbol used for impedance. Impedance is just a fancy word for resistance. So it's the resistance of the coil or solenoid plus some stuff like inductance or reactance, you know, factored in. So back in the day, all high flow, you know, 900,000, 2,000 cc injectors were low impedance. And why? Because it was because of the technology at the time. So the technology and the valve and solenoid, um, Low impedance, less impedance in the circuit means the uh, uh, injector driver signal would open the injector quicker and you could hold it open longer without it overheating as much. That's not a thing anymore. Now the whole market has gone to high impedance um, and high impedance is better for larger flow now that technology is better, right? Um, tolerances, coil strength, efficiency, right? High impedance. The pro for real, I guess that's a summon into one real thing. The, uh, the pro for high impedance injectors and why that's what everyone uses is you have better valve control because you can use a more saturated or a stronger signal without overheating, right? That stronger or saturated signal would open a low impedance injector quicker, but you won't have as good a valve control. Like, so when the signal is given to open, comes open really quick, you might have some movement less control of the valve and the coil, and then it shuts. Whereas high impedance is considered more linear control, right? And by that, I mean, if you were to look at performance of an injector, right? Uh, a linear injector has a nice slope, linear slope. And this scale would be, you know, flow, flow rating of the injector over time. And a, a con to a low impedance injector, um, you know, something in the one, two, three ohm range um, is at high pulse widths and low pulse widths, you would lose some control of a low impedance injector. Whereas a high impedance, because I can send a much more stronger saturated signal, even at really low and high ends of the spectrum, I have very good control. So that's more tunability, drivability, idle, cruise, you know, on off throttle. You don't want your car bucking or stalling. You know, in a motorsport or race application, right? There's times when you're you're decelling off throttle, coming back on throttle in a turn, what whatever the case may be. All those weird areas in the flow versus time slope of the injector curve, you have much more better control with the ECM computer with a high impedance injector. All right, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So if you see an injector that's high Z. That's what you want. That's what everyone runs now. It's been that way for a bit. Some old school setups, they'll run some really large, like like an old EFI setup running like billet atomizer injectors. You know, they're running methanol. They need a ton of flow. Or even on a V8, they have like 16 injectors because they need so much flow with methanol. 
they'll tend to use a driver that can run low impedance injector still. But high impedance is the way. All right, I said I was going to stop, stop talking about impedance, so I really am this time. Um, so that was the first term we talked about, impedance, Z. Uh, the next biggest thing is flow matching. I think most of the community <coughs> knows what injector flow matching is now. Some people still don't. They get a little confused. So when I flow match an injector, right, so I get multiple injectors and I want to match them, <coughs> I'm not modding anything in the injector. So when someone flow matches injectors, they're not tweaking the metering plate. They're not adjusting anything, right? All they're doing is testing off-the-shelf injectors and then matching sets that flow similar so you have less variance from cylinder to cylinder. And there's different ways to flow match. Uh, the most standard way or the first way you want to start your flow match is a static, a static test. And a static test is you run the injector full open, max pulse width, and then that's also where you determine the flow rating. So if I say I have a 47 pound injector, when I run it wide open, it's giving me 47 pounds an hour of fuel delivery. Excuse me. So um, when the injector is static or wide open like that, you can get flow variance from manufacturing tolerances, right? Because I'll dive into what's static. That, that's another term I'll use. It goes into duty cycle. So eventually, when an injector is static, it means you're running them at such a long, wide pulse width that the order for the next pulse for the injector comes and before the previous one closes, right? So normally, like, two or three millisecond car idling, right? My pulses are really far apart, right? Um, at high RPM, or when I'm approaching the static limit of the injector, I'll have a pulse like that but this pulse won't finish and the next one already started opening again and overlaps and the worse it gets essentially the um the valve never closes so i'm sure you've heard the term you don't want to run your injectors in static on the car because like we talked about <laughs> that metering plate and the time the injector is open controls the fuel delivery and the pulse. So if the valve is always open, I just have fuel flowing through it. I have less, I'm not metering the pulse as well because the valve's never shutting. Um, I can get flow variance based on just the physical geometry of the injector. So it's not common to see static flow variance, or sorry, not uncommon. Um, it is pretty good nowadays I want to say the Bosch spec is like 6% for static flow variance, which is actually really good. Like I'll get um, used OEM injectors and I'll put them on the fl my flow machine and they'll actually usually be really tight, static, which is good. But that's just one snapshot. That means when I'm running the injector static, which there is danger in running a static, like I mentioned, you could lose air fuel control. And the big thing for that, let me backtrack a minute. It's not like a fuel pump. If you max a fuel pump and you run out of flow, you're going to have a pressure drop in the rail, and you're going to see it on your gauge, and you're going to lose air fuel control, right? Let out of it. When an injector goes static and you lose air fuel control, you might not necessarily see it because let's say I had a set of 47-pound injectors, and when they were static, I had 10 20% variance, right? So... One's down around 40 pounds, and another one's up to 52, 47, 49, right? Whatever. 10 to 20%. That means when I'm static, I have cylinders that are getting less and more fuel than each other. Now, overall, my as measured by a wideband in the exhaust, my, my air fuel ratio, like if I'm targeting 11 to 1, I might not see it on a wideband. My overall air fuel for the entire motor looks good but I could have cylinders that are running leaner than the other ones because I'm at the mercy of static flow. Make sense? Okay, I'm gonna stop talking about that now. So typically injectors go, sorry, I lied again. <laughs> I'll just get over all this stuff now before I move on. Uh, the typical 
hard limit that people try not to go over is 90% duty cycle. Anything at 90% and above duty cycle on an injector, it's in the static range. The valve is never closing during pulses. So a lot of online calculators that to determine what size injector you need for your horsepower like to use a max of 85% uh, duty cycle to give you some buffer, right? Okay, and then back to flow matching. The next thing is called dynamic flow matching. And two of the bigger name companies um, like Injector Dynamics, hence the name Injector Dynamics, uh, FIC, Fuel Injector Clinic, were some of the first in the motorsport industry to start um, dynamic flow matching. So now you have that curve, that slope at, you know, over time or time, flow, and pulse width. You'll pick points on the curve, right? So I'll pick a frequency that pulses here, or, you know, simulating like 1,000 RPM on the car, 3,000 RPM, 7,000 RPM if you want to equate pulse width to RPM, which is essentially how the injector works. So I'm going to pick multiple points on the, on the slope and test it. And that's actually how I get, like if you ever look at an injector curve or slope, or that, that data is used for tuning, um, right? You flow here, you flow at, at multiple points in the operating range, and then you draw a line through it and you get your slope of, of flow. So dynamic means now I took it a step further. So say I was doing a set of eight, I was trying to flow match a set of eight injectors. I'm going to static flow like 100 injectors. And then all the ones that were within 1% to 2% static, I put off to the side, right? Say I got like 50 of them that were within a spec for static. Now I'm going to test each injector at a different point in the slope dynamically to simulate different operating ranges. And then I'm going to match them again. Does that make sense? So now... I'm static flow matched, and then I took it a step further, and I dynamically flow matched it. And then the next step um, is uh, like offset um, matching. So we're still talking about flow matching here, but give me a second. There's different terms. People get them confused. So if you hear injector offset, um, latency, or dead time, dead times, it's all the same thing. And I'll explain what all that is. So I have an injector pulse, right? But there is dead time latency or offset in when the PCM orders the injector to open and when it orders it to close. And that offset needs tuned so that the injector, the car drives well and the injector delivers the right amount of fuel. So what that looks like on the slope is... Um, I wanted the injector here to open here. Here comes the signal. So the driver sends the signal, sends a, a voltage to the coil in the, in the injector to post, post, post open, gets sent here. And then there's a delay in when the valve seat opens and starts opening. That is called latency, dead time, or offset. You can use any one of those terms. People interchange them. And that's usually measured in like milliseconds. So maybe offset was like, you know, two milliseconds or whatever it may be. Um, tuners need that data. So now I wanted the injector to actually open here. So I'm going to put in the tune, I'm going to plug in that offset data. So now it sends the signal earlier. So it actually opens the injector when I wanted it to and then closes it when I wanted it to. That's all offset or latency is. So um, that's typically the thing. If your latency is off in your tune, you're, and hey, people always look around like I need injector data. Um, the, the most common thing that will make an injector hard to tune is having bad latency or offset data. So a lot of um, self-tuners and like, Guys, there's formulas and there's a way to test your injector and figure out the latency. But nowadays, everyone wants stuff simple. We want quick tunes. We want plug and play stuff. So uh, most big name injector companies have characterization data, which they give you offset times and all that stuff based on battery voltage. And it all scales and 
it's like plug and play. So you can, you know, I can have a controlled flow match set of injectors and have standard data that'll run everyone really good in the car, right? So that's a step further is offset matching. Um, and you could pick points, offsets at different voltages. It scales too. So like whether my battery was putting out 12 volts or 12.5 or 14 volts, right? You make a scale based on the voltage going to the injector and what the offset time is. You plug that into the tune, you're good to go. But so for flow matching, that's the last part. Not everybody does that. Um, I know Thick Fuel Injector Clinic does. Um, they they offset match or dead time match too. Which all that boils down to is I have a very finely matched set of injectors for my car. So I know um, each injector is delivering the same amount of fuel to each cylinder, right? That's the benefit of flow matching for motorsport injectors. All right, I'm going to stop. <laughs> stop talking about that. That's pretty much flow matching in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, let's see what else we talked about. We talked about offsets and pedants. Um, all right, so to wrap it up, I'm just going to talk about some math. So like I said, there are online calculators to determine what size injector I need to support the power I want. Like, I want to safely support a 1,000 rear wheel horsepower on a 5-liter V8 with a supercharger. How do I figure out what size injector I need? So like I said, you could go Google an online calculator. They work. Um, but I have a much simpler quick formula for them. You know, I like thumb rule formulas. So the first thing we need to look at is brake specific fuel consumption. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically how much, how much fuel mass, um, the engine needs to support a horsepower. It's usually, it's a ratio. So, um, some common numbers are like 0.4 to 0.45 to 0.5 for like an NA motor, depending on how it's based on the air fuel and the displacement of the motor, right? So a seven-cylinder engine, naturally aspirated, will consume more fuel than a naturally aspirated four-cylinder. A turbocharged four-cylinder with 30 pounds of boost that needs an air fuel. So instead of like a 13, 14 stoic, it needs like a 10, 5 to 11 stoic that turbocharged smaller displacement smaller less cylinder motor in that case will consume more fuel than the larger naturally aspirated v8 so um so i'm going to be just talking about a v8 here so the a nice number to use is 0.6 right for a power a boosted um v8 motor the brake specific fuel consumption will be about 0.6. Um, you will need that if you're gonna use a calculator. I'm just showing you, I'm not using a calculator, but I'm showing you the values that went into this easy math, super easy math that I'm about to show you. So I used a brake specific fuel consumption of 0.6 because it's a good average. Um, uh, turbo, different types of blowers can need different air fuel ratios, right? Uh, like a, a twin screw has a little hotter temps, it has parasitic loss on the motor, it's going to consume f uh, fuel differently than like a sentry blower would, if that makes sense. But the range is typically 0.55 to 0.65, so 0.6 is right in the middle, so I'm using 0.6 be a brake specific fuel consumption for this thumb roll. Um, the next thing I'm using is... Uh, I mean, I guess I'll just get to the formula. But if you wanted to go in there, I think I already mentioned it. I'm using an eight-cylinder motor. So if you plug this into a calculator, you get similar, similar results. I'm using an eight-cylinder motor that has boost with a 0.6 brake specific fuel consumption. Okay, moving on. So all that said and done, super easy. One cc is one rear wheel horsepower. That's as simple as it gets, <laughs> right? So a 1,000 cc injector will support about safe. Oh, the other thing I forgot to put in here, 85% max duty cycle, right? Because I don't want to go static. I don't want to get 90 or above duty cycle. 
So if, I, if you were to use a calculator, I'm using 0. 0.6 and I'm using a max duty cycle in the injector of 85% for safety. It gives me a 5% buffer. So using that data, which is good average data, it works out that uh, every cc of the flow rate in the injector equals one rear wheel horsepower. Now, that is on gasoline, okay? If I want to get to ethanol, specifically if I want to get to E85, because that's the common ethanol blend used, it's going to be 80% of that number. So I would times that by 0 0.8. And here, in this case, it's easy math. There it is. I knew you'd like this one. So if I had a 90, uh, I guess I should talk. And CC, these are mass flow rates. Everyone abbreviates. So a lot of times we abbreviate a 47 pound an hour injector, right? It's actually pounds per hour. And this is actually, you know, like that's probably close to 500 cc's per minute. So these, because it's all um, flow over time, right? So this is mass flow, mass flow over time and volumetric flow over time, right? Just kind of like the same pounds per minute or CFM for like airflow. Similar concept. Um, if you there are calculators to convert from pounds per hour to cc this formula is, works best with cc um, it's 10.5 so if i want to get from pounds per hour to cc per minute i just multiply this by 10.5 so in that case let's actually look at what a so if I have a 47 pound injector times 10.5 gives me 494 cc rounded. Okay, so that tells me a 47 pound injector is good for 500. Oh wait, Jeremy, I'm making 550 on it. Your math's wrong. Yeah, but where are you running the duty cycle at? Guys do this a lot. And a lot of times, not all tuners pay attention to duty cycle. They just look at air fuel, right? Unless they get in there and like have a have the ability to look at injector duty cycle, you could be static and you could have cylinders richer and leaner than the other, even though, oh, I got 11.2 air fuel. It's good. It's good till 7,000 RPM. Everything's fine. That's the danger of running. So this is, this is a safe thumb rule. So... This tells me with a 47 pound injector for maximum safety, I want to limit it to around 500 horsepower because it's around 500 cc, 500 wheel horsepower, right? We'll do the math for another injector real quick. And then I'll talk about one more thing before I finish this up. It's getting long, sorry. You all might have to skip through this just to pick out what you want. So a lot of times the flow rates you see are smidged. <laughs> so what does that mean? So if I say 95 pounds an hour or 1,000 cc injectors, cc per minute injectors, a lot of times we're rounding to nice marketing numbers, guys. So just keep that in mind. Make sure you look up the flow specs. Flow specs. I know when like um, the first ID1000s came out, they actually flowed around 960 to 980 cc. They weren't actually a 100 cc, or sorry, a 1,000 cc injector. And just like when I say it's a 47 or 56 or 60 pound injector, it's usually not actually exactly that. It's usually plus or minus some. So those 47s might actually flow 47.5. Or those 60s might flow 62 or they might flow 58, right? So we typically call a 95 pound injector a 1,000 cc. But if I do the math from 95 pounds an hour to times 10.5, it's actually 997.5 cc. So it's close to 1,000 in that case, but not quite. Makes sense? Um, the biggest one was like um, 2,000s or 210s. Like the this these uh, 210 pound or... Um, 2000 series injector actually flowed closer to like 21 and some change or 2200 cc right and then you can change i didn't talk about it i'll kind of sneak it in here at the end these flow rates are based on a standard testing pr pressure 
that pressure varies. Sometimes they use Ford 39.15 PSI. Sometimes they use a more universal testing of three bar, which is like 43.5 PSI, I believe, off the top of my head. So when you change the PSI acting in the rail behind the injector, right, um, the more it's going to deliver per pulse. So if you say I have a 72-pound injector, it says it flows 72 pounds. Like, great, that's the size I need because I did this little formula, 72 times um, 10.5 gives me cc, 756 cc. And I only want 700, 750 horsepower. I should be good. That'll keep me under 85% duty cycle. But you didn't look in the comments where they tested at four bar. So they tested it at like 58 PSI. So now if I bring this back down from 58 PSI to 40 PSI, the injector is flowing less. I'm just guessing. Probably around 64 pounds. Might be less. There's formulas for calculating that too. Um, it's not that much typically. Um, I think every... Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think every 10 PSI changes flow 3 to 4 to 5 pounds an hour. Something like that. And it depends on the size of the injector. So yeah, there's the quick math. Um, CC, 1 CC of, of flow rating in the injector is 1 real horsepower. I'll do one more calculation for you. So say I got uh, 1,300 CC injectors, right? So... Easy math, 1,300 horsepower and gas, but E85, so I want to times 1,300 times 0.8 to do 80%, so that's 1,040 rear wheel horsepower on E85. So there you go. So a little uh, information about injectors, terms, flow matching, and an easy formula to get you into a safe range for injectors you need. Uh, Again, when it comes to fuel, bigger is better in most cases. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, is it harmful to have not enough fuel? Yes. Does it hurt to have, okay, I, I only want 800 rear wheel horsepower and gas, but I have 1,000 cc injectors. Does that hurt anything? No. It just means the injector doesn't run as high in pulse width. It's no danger of going static. It's going to be safe. It's going to operate at a lower, lower duty cycle. So you can always go bigger to a degree. I'll touch on that real quick. Sorry, I know this video is getting long. I, I said it wasn't, but I guess there was a lot more I wanted to talk about. Um, to a degree, typically up to around 1,300 to 1,440 cc, which is another common size FIC uses. That's about where um, injector size has no negative side effects. So you can get injectors that are 1,000, 1,200, 1300 up to about 1440 cc and they still have very good they still have a nice linear slope um, they have good data they idle and drives like stock they behave well they're easy to tune when you get to larger injectors like um, 15 16 1700 and like 2000 cc you know, these, these big boys um, they don't they start doing weird stuff at low pulse widths they because because the metering plate is so big and they have to pulse so much to flow those high flow rates at high uh, high duty cycles down low they they're dumping more fuel and they have not as good control so drivability tunability cold start can be a little more tricky it takes a little more tuning effort um to get them good in their car so in that case like oh then why don't i just throw a 2000 cc and be done with it depends on what you're doing um, so generally you can go a little bigger and you're safe. If you go too big, you might unnecessarily be giving yourself some, some heartache from the tuning and drivability side of the house. Um, the bigger injectors perform even better on E85 because E85 is less energy than gas. So I'm putting more volume and mass into the cylinder. So because I'm flowing more through, through the injector at these higher pulse, uh, flow rates, uh, they tend to be easier to tune. Whereas if I tried to tune like 
race gas on a um, 2000 cc injector it's going to be harder to tune down low okay that's it um i went over a bunch of stuff what i really want you to take out is like i was mentioning flow matching a little bit of knowledge about um, the size the sizes um the other thing i didn't talk about is like the heights different applications call for different heights they make uh top hats and bottom adapters that will change the height for installed on the rail so that's another thing guys talk about um so usually when you get an, an aftermarket injector from a name brand company they'll have the right top hat but sometimes you might buy some second hand and like oh they're too short for my rail they don't fit well you often just need a certain size top hat to make them fit so there it is and then there's that simple formula which i like all right that's it um if you made it through this entire video, uh, thanks. And if, you like, if you're liking these videos, please like and subscribe. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, um, just throw them down and I'll get to them. All right. Thanks, guys.